Hi, my name is Pratap Chatterjee and I'm the Executive Director of CorpWatch. I've traveled to the Middle East and to Central Asia more than a dozen times since September 11, 2001, spending more than 16 months on the ground in the region to invest, investigate military contractors. Uh, I've in, in, uh, visited Iraq four times and uh, Afghanistan four times and traveled as a journalist, mostly in the red zones, accompanied generally only by a fixer or a translator. In addition, I've also embedded with the U.S. military and visited bases in Iraq, Kuwait, Kosovo, and Afghanistan. And I've written two books on the subject, Halliburton's Army and Iraq, Inc. The activities of the contractors I investigated range from low-skill tasks like janitorial, kitchen, and transportation services to essential military logistical support functions like weapons maintenance and security protection. But by far and away, the biggest by revenue and employee numbers was Halliburton of Houston, Texas, whose CEO was once Dick Cheney, and he quit that job just before he became Vice President of the United States under George Bush Jr. Halliburton's former subsidiary, Kellogg Brown and Root, often known as KBR, um, has grossed over $30 billion since it won a 10-year contract in late 2001 to supply U.S. troops in combat situations around the world. By the end of the eight year of years of the Bush administration, the company claimed that its cooks had served more than 720 meals, its drivers had logged over 400 million miles on the road, and its workers had treated 12 billion gallons of potable water for the troops, or so they claimed. At the height of the war, there were 50,000 KBR employees, or one KBR worker for every, three US soldier, for every US soldier in Afghanistan and Iraq. The main function of these workers was to build and to maintain military bases, to make sure that soldiers were fed, their clothes were washed, and their showers and toilets kept clean. And while many stories have been written about the kind of salaries that some of these Halliburton uh, employees make, $80,000, $100,000, and, and much more, in reality, most of the company's workers made a lot less, mainly because they were hired from countries like India and the Philippines, where a standing salary of $300 a month is considered a fortune. And it is actually very important to understand that these workers did not enjoy the same quality of life. And in fact, their lives were much harder than they expected when they left their countries thinking that they would make a fortune in the Middle East. To give you an example, I spent a lot of time with Fijian truck drivers who made hundreds of dangerous uh, truck trips from Kuwait, in which they would drive large 18-wheel refrigeration trucks that carried all manner of goods destined for U.S. soldiers at bases in Iraq. But these truck drivers didn't get to sleep in the tents that they helped supply. They did not get to use those showers. They had to sleep in the uh, trucks, and they were paid $2.50 an hour. While these employees were being exposed to mortal danger, and they were underpaid, documents from the Army Corps of Engineers showed that KBR was charging the government double the market price for importing gasoline into Iraq from Kuwait. They also overcharge the U.S. government for meal supply to troops at five military bases in Iraq and Kuwait. The company has also been charged with providing soldiers with unchlorinated shower water and shoddy electrical work that caused a dozen soldiers to be electrocuted and killed. Take, for example, Staff Sergeant Christopher Lee Everett from Huntsville, Texas, who was killed in September 7, 2005 at Camp Takadam in Iraq while he was power washing sand from the underside of a Humvee. On January 2nd, 2008, Staff Sergeant Ryan Masseth of Shaler Township in Pennsylvania was electrocuted to death while showering his barracks at the Radawania Palace Complex in Iraq. You must understand that since 9-11, we've undergone eight years of invasions and occupations under Bush, followed by eight years of covert wars and assassinations under Obama. And today, we are less secure than ever before. And as we begin, perhaps, the most uncertain and most dangerous period of U.S. history since World War II, it behooves us to take a look back and figure out why and how we embarked on this path. The Middle East looks likely to explode in coming years, and the fault lies with us for lighting that power, powder keg. We don't need Nuremberg trials, but we at least need a South African-style Truth and Reconciliation Commission in order to diffuse this anger, seek just solutions, and move forward. And exposing the profiteering from this war is perhaps one of the most important tasks that we can undertake.